Hello, and welcome to Learning Music with Pat. Today I've decided to bring in to you an Israeli kind of a recorder. It's actually a type of flute, but it's different than most flutes that you would have here. It is a doubled flute. If you look at this carefully, you can see that there are two flutes, two flutes, and these little things, which are the top of the flutes, and they're all tied on. Otherwise, you'd lose them because you can't hold them in right, at least I can. This is made out of bamboo, and uh, you blow into the top a, a little parts here, and this is what you would normally do if I were playing it. I would soak this in, in some water, both of these. You see, you can't separate these. These are all tied together with string, and the only way to get them apart is to cut the string, but you wouldn't want to do that because the instrument is made to play, so you can play two at the same time. How many people do you know can play two instruments at the same time? But basically you can with this one. So it's bamboo. Bamboo absorbs water. And so what you would normally do if you were playing is you would take a little dish, and I've done this, but I'm not going to do it here. I'd take a little dish of water, maybe a little small jar, and I would put each top, top in it and let it soak for a while. And it's such that the bamboo is such that when you take the top part out, it's dry. It has absorbed water but it's dry, it feels dry to the touch. And this is the way bamboo is, it absorbs water, and but it doesn't feel wet, it feels dry. And then I would take, and I would put each one, they probably will not hold because I haven't soaked them, and put each one on the top of each one. There you have it, that's the flute right there. There are no tone holes in the back, all of the tone holes are in the front, and if I place it right, I would find, this is probably not going to hold, but there is on this side a little, little kind of a, uh, a, a piece of wood that you lift up. It's like a reed. It's considered to be a reed. If you look in the instructions, it's a reed, and you put the reed toward the front. Now, I don't know if you can see the reed because it's actually just a piece of bamboo that's been cut out a little bit. If I twist it, maybe you can see it a little bit. Okay, you got it. And there's one on each, one of each of these extensions. And there's also a little hole on each. If I can show it, I know where they are, but the thing is, I don't know, is they're so tiny, I'm not sure that I can show them to you. And they're also covered by that string. So what you're supposed to do when you play it, I'm hunting for that little hole here. I don't know if it's worth hunting for, but it is here. Just trust my judgment on it. I see it. Okay. You see this little, I'm not sure that you can see it, but this is the reed right here. And on the side here is this little tiny hole. So if you put, you're supposed to put your mouth on it, soak it, put your mouth on it, on the reed, and the reed starts to flap around and vibrate and you get a tone. Now I have been able to get tones out of it, but this is an unusual instrument and you want an advance, you cannot play regular music with it. I mean, the scale is all different and you just can't do it. It's really kind of a novelty item, but, but this should vibrate, this little, and I'll hold it out here, and there are two of them, they're just exactly alike, there's one on each. It'll vibrate and create a sound, and then you can play some kind of music, but it's not traditional music. I don't know, if you're familiar with the Indian flutes, they don't play a regular scale. They play a pentatonic scale, and it's different than our diatonic uh, scales, uh, or our chromatic scales, it's all different. Well, this is all different too. Somebody came back from Israel and they got it and decided to give it to me, so this is a gift. And it really is a terrific little instrument, but I'd never be expertise on it because the whole way that it's played is so much different than what I would do. But, you know, you soak it, you, you put these in, and if you see, there's little etchings where they've carved down here and they fit right in the top of it. 
And if, it, if they are, are put in water, they've absorbed enough water, so I suppose they're a little bit swelled, and they'll stay in that position, and anyone who wants to play it, who knows how to play it, can do it. The reason that it's tied up, there's no guarantee how long that's going to stay like that. You start playing it, it's going to start falling out. So it's tied up, so you won't lose it. You know, it's just an unusual instrument. I like to bring them in. I do have a number of unusual instruments, and I do like to bring them in because most people never get a chance to see anything like this. It isn't anything you'd see being played, but it is a nice little instrument, and you can see it's hand-carved, it's handmade, it's hand-tied together with that string, and I do have instructions. I'm just going to show you the instructions. And you're not going to be able to see it very well, and you're not going to be able to read the writing, but it says, before playing, loosen the reeds by gently lifting up the reeds at this end. Now, I've showed you where the reeds are. Uh, then to play it, insert the mouthpiece into the mouth with lips beyond the reed. So you have quite a bit of the instrument in your mouth. And then it says, position the first three fingers of the right hand over the top uh, six holes. And then the first three fingers of the left hand on the bottom. So you can play. Actually, you, you've got two instruments in your mouth. Um, and then it says, remember the scale of Eastern music is different from ours. Therefore, it would be almost impossible to play any song with which we are familiar in our culture. In other words, it's a nice little instrument, but you're not going to be able to play anything that we're familiar with because all you're going to do is get different sounds from it. Um, these flutes have not been sterilized. This was an extra note that they sent me. These flutes have not been sterilized. They will not be harmed by soaking in water and detergent, so you can wash them, you know? I, I, I would be very careful of that, but you can use some mild soap and some water and go over the mouthpieces and the reeds and make them a little cleaner. Dry thoroughly after soaking before attempting to play. Now this looks like this has all been handwritten out, and I think it has been, with kind of a sketch of what the instrument is and what it looks like. You know, and it came with it. Those are the only instructions I had. There's no fingering charts or anything like that. Just this is where you place your hand, this is where you put your mouth, and basically good luck. You know, when you play it, because you're not going to be able to play normal music. I just wanted to show you, if we had any idea of how many instruments exist, we just would be amazed at how many instruments exist. And I know in wartime, in Europe, during wartime, uh, people used to bury their instruments because one of the things that happened, music is God's gift, and one of the things that happens is um, the people who were at, at warfare, they were in danger of losing their instruments. They did not, whoever the enemy was, they did not want music, and they did not want playing music, which shows you how, what a gift it really is, and they would destroy instruments. So a lot of people just buried their instruments, and hopefully at some day, when things were safer, they could just undo them and take them back out again because they were supposed to destroy instruments and they were not willing to do that. I wouldn't be willing to do that either. So that's uh, what I wanted to show you for today. Now I'm going to go on here and we'll take a look at the music on this, on this uh, music that I have here. I have talked to you about the timing of music. You have a whole note that's er, worth four beats usually, a half note worth two, quarter notes worth one, and then you have the eighth note, which is worth half of what a quarter, quarter note would be. But you can write music that sounds the same in different time signatures. So I am going to play this. This, is, this song here is exactly the same as this song here, but it's in a different time, and yet you'll, it will be the same. So I'm going to play it, and then I'm going to kind of dissect it for you. This is how it goes. I'm playing it in 6-8 time, but I'll explain all of that when I finish. This is how it goes.
Now, I played that in 6-8, so if I dissect this for you, this is what we do. This is in the key of 6-A. That means the top number is how many beats of measure that you have. And this is the type of note that it is. There are six beats to a measure. It's in the key of G, and I have that, uh, that's denoted by the fact that I have a, an F sharp. And eight is on the bottom. That's the type of note it is. Now, you can use any other type of note that you want to, but it has to uh, be equivalent to what the what six, eight notes would be. So if I'm to count this, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I've used all eighth notes. And the only time I've made a change is right here for this quarter note. And this quarter note is worth two eighth notes. That's just the way it is. And so it would be counted one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. This would be three beats. Why? Because a quarter note is composed of two eighths. When you put a dot beside it, you add another eighth to it because a dot is half the value of the note that precedes it. So if this is worth two beats because it's the equivalent of two eighth notes, this just adds another eighth note to it. Put them all together, you get three beats. Now what if I want to play this? This is just an exercise, it's not a real song, but what if I want to play it here? I do, I'm doing it in quarter notes, three, four. So there are three beats to the measure, and four quarter notes, and the quarter notes are the kind of note that it is. Now I could still use eighth notes, I can still use even sixteenths, whatever I want to, but totally it has to go in, and uh, be equivalent to three quarter notes. So I play it the same way, so I'm going to do it again, but I'm playing it now in three quarter time. exactly the same as it was before, except now I've changed my time, but it doesn't matter that I've changed my time. It's what you need to hear, and you hear the exact same thing. So when you're thinking about the eighth notes, whoops, excuse me, I dropped that, I'll just let it stay. When you're thinking of the eighth notes, six, eight time, one beat. And if you're dealing with a quarter notes, three, fourth time, one beat, thank you. So that's the way that you do the time. You can change it. And now I'm going to go over to the next page and uh, show you another piece of music. This is going to be a march. It's going to be in 4-4 four, four time. And here's 1, 2, 3, and 4, and. I'm using eighth notes, but it's 4-4 four, four time. It's four beats to a measure, and the uh, equivalent is, is four quarter notes, four, four time. Now, I could have written it in other times, but this is why I did it, because it's easier for you to learn. And uh, we're going to start with two beats on the, uh, on the rest. This is a two beat rest. This looks like a little line here. And then this is an eighth rest, and these are three eighth notes. So you've got one, two, three and four and. Now I'm going to play it slow, but if you were to play it, you would play it slow and then increase the speed. That's the whole thing. It is a mark. Now let me kind of dissect this for you. Um, you will notice that there are, are holes. This is one, two, three, and four n. This is a whole, a half note, so it's two beats. And then I have it attached to an eighth note. And there are four eighth notes 
to two beats, one, two, three, and four, and. And if I have to have that hole there, so it like, it's like a longer note, a plain note, rather than having it without a hold. If I don't have it with a hold, it's going to sound something like this. Uh, horrible but that's not the way I want to have it sound. I need to have some notes a little longer so I add an eighth note and I just put a hold over it and that's how you get it. Now when you're going to practice it you would be practicing it very slow to begin with because it's just something that you need to do. You have to have tonguing, you have to learn how to tongue, you have to learn when to hold, and that's when that whole thing appears, and how long to hold it, and uh, when you want to take a breath, and how you finger the notes, and where the accidentals are, and I did not put any uh, in, the, in the time, in the key signature, I didn't put any sharps or flats, but I've added them all in, F sharp, F sharp and uh, F sharp and so it's gone. This is a G sharp right here, another F sharp. So they're all accidentals and if you play it slow <laughs> here. I shortened that note and there's a dot right there. That's called a stinger and you can usually see it on marches because this is a march. A march is a type of song that's very sprightly and you know it's very cheerful and it's very usually quite fast. You wouldn't play it fast to begin with. You start slow and work up to whatever speed you want. At the end you just got that dot. And that's the end of the song. How do you know when a song ends? Well, you know when a song ends because either it gets real loud at the end, so it's like a bombastic ending, or it really gets soft on the end, or it slows down on the end. And in this case with a march, it may not do any of those things, but the last note has that little dot on top. It's like a staccato note. You just play it quickly. You put your tongue up by your teeth and just very quickly and then stop the air so it doesn't hold out and it's called the stinger and most marches a lot of marches have stingers I like marches I like them because they're cheerful they can teach you a lot and I'm going to be doing more with them as as time goes on but I see our time is beginning to run out so when you get a piece of music to play remember the things you have to know and they're real basic things you have to learn basic things to play well you have to know how to hold the instrument how to blow into it how to tongue I cannot play anything like this without being able to tongue, when to slur and what that means and how to do it. You have to have enough air to be able to push in and know when you're supposed to breathe. Now this may not seem a lot. If you're an accomplished musician already, it all comes naturally. You also have to know how to finger the notes because some notes have more than one fingering. On a saxophone, you have five fingerings to play a B flat. And which, B, which fingering you use for a B flat depends upon the notes that come before it and the 
the notes that come after it. So there's a lot to learn, but if you learn the basics, you can put them all together, and with enough practice, it really begins to sound good. So I suggest also that when you start to practice, you use holding tones, so that improves your sound, it improves your, your lung strength and your, your the strength of your diaphragm, so you can hold notes a lot longer. And uh, it, it really is, when you finally get all those basics down, you really can learn to play quite well. So I'm going to continue with this. I'm going to try to show you instruments, unusual instruments, which I will bring in, and then show you some basic music skills. And I have written a lot of new music that I want to use for this class, too. So I'm going to close it here, and we'll be continuing with this next time. Please join me then.